Hello and welcome. It's March 23rd, 2023, and we're here in ActiveInf Livestream 53.1. Welcome to the Active Inference Institute. We're a participatory online institute that is communicating, learning, and practicing applied active inference. This is a recorded and an archived live stream, so please provide us with feedback so we can improve our work. All backgrounds and perspectives are welcome, and we'll be following video etiquette for live streams. Head over to activeinference.org to learn more about the Institute and learning groups and projects. We're here in Active Stream 53.1, and we are discussing a dyad of papers. We are discussing Snakes and Ladders in Paleoanthropology by Hector, Carl, and Michael. Welcome, Carl. And we're discussing to copy or not to copy with Hector and Michael. Previously in 53.0, we, Dean and I, provided some background and context on these papers. And today in 53.1, First, we will all say hello. Then we will feature a presentation by Michael Walker. And following the presentation, we'll have a discussion and see where it goes. So with no further ado, we will all say hello, the non-authors first, then the authors, concluding with Michael and leading into the presentation. So I'm Daniel. I'm a researcher in California, and it was a great fun and learning experience to work on the dot zero. So I'm really excited to continue in the dot one today to Dean. Thanks, Daniel. I'm Dean. I'm here in Calgary. Um, I guess the only thing I want to just highlight today is the fact that it's a uh, three, two, three, two, three. And I, 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 I love that bouncing back and forth between those, uh, those two quantities. So um, I'm really excited and I will pass this to Hector. Okay, hello, I'm Hector Manrique, and I will just summarize what brought me here. Basically, I graduated in psychology, that was in Spain, and then I did my PhD in psychobiology, so I came to learn the biological basis of behavior. Um, then I recycled into a comparative psychology when I joined the Max Planck Institute of, for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. I was lucky that I could work with Joseph Kai under his supervision. And then I had the opportunity to work with the four species of great apes. And after that, I, I, I came to know Michael in a conference on human evolution, and we have been working together ever since. So we are now good friends and also colleagues. And that's it, basically. Thank you, Hector. And Carl, if you'd like to say hello before yes, we head, please. So my name is Carl Friston. Uh, I'm a professor of neuroscience at University College London um, and a colleague um, of our sort of main speakers today, who I've never seen in person, uh, but now at least I've seen you uh, in, in virtually. So very nice to meet you. Great. Thank yeah. you, Carl. Michael, the floor is yours. Uh, I'm, Michael. Uh, I'm very pleased to say hello to Carl, uh, whom I've not yet met personally. But we're now meeting visually, virtually. Um, I'm a retired professor at the University of Murcia in Spain. Uh, I'm getting rather ancient. I shall be 82 years old tomorrow. But anyway, th that doesn't stop me from digging up Neanderthal skeletons and even earlier things here in Spain. Um, I'm very pleased to be uh, presenting this. It's a case of the dog that didn't bark in the night. So um, whenever. Uh, you want me to begin? I can begin, um, Daniel. Yes, the uh, slide is up and it is all okay. you. Well, this is really a paper which we have out on SciArchive in, the version, in an earlier version. It's now been modified for a different journal to the one that was originally intended. But the presentation is in order to make a complicated uh, subject fairly simple to comprehend. I call it snakes and ladders because stuff appears, disappears and reappears throughout human evolution over the past at least two million years, if not before. And the question is, 
why is there not a continuous trajectory? Let's move on to the next one, Daniel. Right. The traditional view is the received wisdom is looking at uh, what paleoanthropology can tell us from the outside. And there are two basic methodologies, one based on geology and Darwinism, uh, which gives us one view of what it is all about. And another view down on the bottom right is all based on uh, what modern people do and what modern apes do. And it's all by so-called analogy. Let's move on to the next one. Both of these have drawbacks. Uh, I won't go into this in detail. You're welcome to uh, take these slides away, provided you don't publish them, because they do include some material drawn from other sources, uh, which I haven't um, uh, acknowledged formally. But the drawbacks to, the, to Darwinism is really the difficulty of being able to prove anything in the past by in its own terms. Um, OK, we can accept it as being a valid way of explaining natural phenomena and evolution. The drawback to using modern analogies is the spatiotemporal incommensurability, incommensurability with regard to uh, the regular irregularities and um, irregular regularities of which things appear, disappear and reappear throughout the Pleistocene record and indeed prehistory in general. Let's move on to the next one. So instead of looking at it from the outside, let's look at it from the inside. And this has an advantage of commensurability uh, and compatibility at the same time with the gradual evolution of and within species by natural selection and at the same time with the documented behavior of Argenus Homo. Uh, well, this is from uh, Carl's and his colleague's latest book. I'm sure you all know it. So let's move on to the next one. Right. Uh, in the 1960s, some archaeologists uh, were certainly reflecting, including some Cambridge friends of mine, uh, on the ostensive presence of irregular regularities and regular irregularities in the archaeological record. And a well-known one is the case of the wheel. Wheels uh, were used for traction in um, Central Asia and the Middle East for about 5,000 years ago. They were invented separately in Mesoamerica just over 2,000 years ago. They weren't used for any kind of practical purpose, but just for moving effigies, uh, statues, and toys around. Uh, and this seems to have been completely independent inventions. Okay, so let's say that surprising enactment with stuff was the exception in uh, early humans. Let's see if I can... I'm getting a little bit tied up with two screens here. I'm working on my own screen at the same time. Uh, cognitive surprises were probably disregarded in general because surprising spontaneous enactment with stuff distracted attention away from daily routines. If we go back two million years ago, when Homo first met, appears from the earlier um, bipedal humans or human ancestors, we begin to see the establishment of the genus Homo, especially in Africa. And I'm sure that spontaneous enactment with stuff certainly occurred innumerable times without gaining any foothold as technological or cultural, if you like, communal behavioral traditions uh, passed down for generation and generation because this is unlikely. If we take a period, let's say from two million years ago, even to, one, even to half a million years ago, that's one and a half million years. That's 60,000 generations. If you consider one generation as lasting 25 years, it's most unlikely that things could be handed down from father to son over 60,000 generations. So let's take a different take on this. Let's go back to looking at it from the inside. From considerations of the free energy principle and active influence, it follows that active influence underpins biological behavior that has exploratory or epistemic and exploitative or pragmatic aspects sensitive, respectively, to ambiguity and risk, enabling epistemic and ambiguity resolving responses 
to support pragmatic reward-seeking ones. And therefore, it is not implausible that the snakes and ladders appearance, disappearance and reappearance of stuff over, let's say, the past two million years of the existence of Arganus, owe to no more than the extreme rarity with which unorthodox epistemic exploration of possibly advantageous opportunities in the human incarnation resulted from incipient, albeit imperceptibly evolving neurobiological propensities uh, in brains or hierarchically me mechanistic minds to generate exploitative pragmatic attention via active influence to cognitive surprises from untoward behavioral incidents, which weren't expressed. Let's move on to the next one. So let's forget about, let's move on to the next one, Daniel. Let's forget about this. Uh, how do I get from here to there? How do I get from a lump of rock to, let's say, a hand axe by spontaneous enactment? What could provoke this? Okay, let's move on. Next slide. I excavated a site, I am excavating a site almost a million years old, which has one hand axe, remains of burning, lots of small stone tools. You can see some burnt ones on the bottom left. But then this is the dog that didn't bark. Why are there no more hand axes? Why do we only have one big, large, bifacially shaped cutting tool, the hand axe, and hundreds of tiny little tools? People don't ask that question. Let's move on to the next one. They explain it away. Well, oh, people really didn't bother with cutting up big animals. They didn't need big cutting tools. Well, that's one way of looking at it. Prove it. People lost stuff, and so there should be more of these around, but there's only one. Well, prove that. There's only one because people took them away and used them elsewhere. Prove that. The problem is these, these so-called interpretations only explain stuff away. Could well have been a Valentine gift or not. Next slide. So let's get back to snakes and ladders. We have fire at the site. There aren't too many sites with fire either. And again, uh, the general assumption is that there was continuity uh, once, yeah, I'm having trouble with moving my other, um, my other screen, just a moment. How can I move this on? Excuse me a moment. Uh, my eyesight isn't all that good these days. No, nope, that's not doing it. Oh dear. Excuse me one minute. Um, um, fire. So we have the, the file, as I've just mentioned, and I don't believe that suddenly fire was brought to humans or invented and then passed on from father to son. Nor do I believe, as we'll see in the next slide, that this was done along with an expansion, can we have the next one, Daniel, please, um, of these early Homo erectus moving from Africa outwards, carrying a hand axe, carrying little embers, and spreading the good news. No. Next slide. Don't think it worked like that. Stuff couldn't have been passed on over all that period of time, over all that space. This is not commensurable with modern human or modern ape behavior. Let's move on to the next one, Daniel. So how do we begin? We begin by bashing stone, enactment with stuff. And that started over three million years ago. We know that. Next one, please. And then we have another problem, which is that there is almost exponential increase in stuff, artifacts made by people. And yet the brain, as we know from fossil evidence, does not follow that trajectory, which is the red one. The brain increases and gradually flattens out at the same time as the number of stuff that people make uh, increases or almost exponentially. Let's have the next one. So here we have another problem to, to try and solve. And one possibility, which was pointed out by the late Professor uh, Philip Tobias, uh, is that as the brain increases, we see in the paleoanthropological paleo record an increase in the uh, variation in the volume of the brain, suggesting perhaps that there is some relaxation of selection pressure as Homo uh, evolved. And we have the next one. That's a point which is worth bearing in mind. 
So let's think about another way of how all this may or may not have happened. A methodological perspective grounded in fundamental biological and physical relationships gives us a parsimonious prosaic deflationary account of all these appearances, disappearances, and reappearances of behavioral outcomes and so-called skills. Now, Professor Nicholas Timbergen, who was a professor of zoology at Oxford and got a Nobel Prize, uh, was fascinated with four questions. Let's have the next slide and see what those are. He wanted to know how we can relate evolution at four different levels, that of ontogeny and that of the mechanisms, the causation, that of phylogeny and that of adaptation or survival value. And these are related uh, diachronically and synchronically, as one can see from this little diagram, into also what one might call proximate and ultimate explanatory um, uh, approaches. If we look at the problem in hand, let's have the next slide, Daniel. Um, we can see that here we have in the diachronic aspects, paleolithic behavior in general, in the synchronic one, stuff appearing at different times in the top right. As far as ontogeny is concerned, we have uh, something which I'll mention later on, but we need to make a big deal of it, that we know that there was a lack of adolescent growth spurt and a relatively uh, um, uh, small brain in Homo erectus one and a half million years ago compared with ours. It's about two thirds the size of ours. When we think of mechanisms here, we come to looking at it from the inside. We have the matter of awareness involving active influence, the free energy principle and variation of free energy. And we have what happens at the neurophysiological level, uh, allowing a complexity of behavior between hand and, and stuff, hand and a stone in this case, or stones. We have to involve matters such as working memory, long-term memory, perspective memory, and indeed um, um, constructive memory. So how does all this tie into phylogeny? Here we have a snakes and ladder model uh, based on the empirical evidence from the past, and we have survival value that clearly existed because Homo erectus eventually gave rise to us. Next slide, please. So let's get back to snakes and ladders. Here we have the man looking at the lock and saying, how the hell do I get this hand axe out of it? And now the next one, and in the same way, with the next slide, we have the snakes and ladders, a game of pure chance and of random outcomes. But, 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 next slide, please. We are not dealing with completely random outcomes. There's a big difference between, on the one hand, a spatiotemporal snakes and ladders game of chance, as if throws of a dice alone brought about appearances, disappearances, and reappearances of behavioral phenomena, unrelated to responses of the hierarchically mechanistic minds of early homo, and on the other hand, a, a snakes and ladders analogy for regular irregularities and irregular regularities in the behavioral record owing to individual idiosyncratic or unorthodox activity and the receptivity to it or not of an observing hierarchically mechanistic mind whether that's an onlooker, a bystander, or that is even the self-same man making the, or woman making the hand axe in this case. Okay, let's move on to the next one. And here we begin to see that the heterogeneous composition of a picture of appearances by chance alone, disappearances by chance alone, reappearances by chance alone, then is it useless as a model for making predictions that can be compared or contrasted with archaeological findings of early paleolithic science. Whereas our preferred model, by focusing on the information theoretic and energetic constraints on biological, neurobiological, and psychosocial evolution, affords us a picture that lets us consider whether the model's focus could offer a rational interpretation of the material record and, in particular, of the uneven distribution across the old world of things like stone hand axes and evidence of the tending of fire or even visiting caves, things that chimpanzees and gorillas don't do, between 2 million and let's say 200,000 years ago, in this case 80,000 generations. 
Okay, let's move on very quickly. And the rest of it, in fact, you're welcome to uh, read for yourselves rather than have me read it out to you because basically um, you, you can take this away or copy it or uh, and download it. What we are arguing is that by about a million years ago, adaptive evolution was underway of cerebral human neurobiological propensities that support perspective and constructive memory in making artifacts or working with stuff, doing unusual, unorthodox things, together with short-term working memory, including that of the hands, haptic working memory, long-term working memory, and long-term procedural and episodic memory. Those propensities were phylogenetic outcomes of existential ontogenetic programs adapted through natural selection for satisfying the bioenergetic requirements of organisms, our genus in particular. So here we have the basis of our argument, that in a small band of communicatively challenged Homo erectus, one member's spontaneous enactment often was, went unregarded, disregarded. It was regarded as useless, pointless, and unhelpful to gathering the food requirements needed for surviving from day to day. And we can refer the matter to the free energy principle applied to ecological niche construction, variation on your orthology, to use Professor uh, Fisson's phrase, whereby selection of adaptive actions for organisms involves their assessment of the alternatives in terms of the expected variation of free energy expressed as a co combination of epistemic and pragmatic affordances. So these early individuals a million and a half years ago who experienced cognitive surprises, that's to say prediction errors about the effect of uh, variation of free energy, were unlikely to introduce novel behaviors, whether affected or seen by them, that could gain a foothold in their community before those communicative skills had developed in some groups that widened their social scope for active influence and had involved by natural selection within a shared framework of adaptive prior beliefs, favoring alignment of common expectations and joint activities that affected their ecological niche. Well, that's the basis of our argument. Um, uh, of course, it's no more, uh, as it were, uh, falsifiable or refutable within the terms of the data from the past than the alternatives that I began with. But at least it makes rational, coherent sense and fits in with the uh, uh, Darwinist view of evolution of species and within species by natural selection. It is a more prosaic and deflationary argument than the uh, ones that people, archaeologists and anthropologists like to use uh, and which I began with. So you can take this away and read it and uh, read it carefully. Uh, what we're arguing is that about a million years ago, uh, sorry, we, uh, can you move on, Daniel? And again. So let's just uh, stick with this. Um, we'll, uh, I think we can. I think we can go through this rather quickly. Move on to the next one, uh, if you would. Yes, so right. Let's go. Let's go back to a million and a half years ago. Let's look at the stuff. We know there's a skeleton of a, a kid only nine years old, according to uh, Professor Christopher Dean of University College, who uh, is professor of dental anatomy, uh, and he studied the teeth. And whilst at one time uh, this individual had the same height as myself, I, I'm about um, um, I'm rather short, about <laughs> one meter uh, fifty-seven. Um, nevertheless. Although he had our oh, adult size, he, only, he was only a child of nine years old, and his skull had almost certainly stopped growing. It was only two thirds or less than the size of ours, but he was, these people were clearly making hand axes and lighting fires, or at least carrying fire around it from time to time, and visiting caves. We know there was one in South Africa, Bondevert Cave, and doing stuff that uh, is sort of halfway between what a chimp does and what our modern primitive peoples are supposed to have been able to do, let's say, 10,000 or 20,000 years ago during the last ice age. But there's a big time difference here. And when we think about this kid, clearly he was developing much sooner than we do. He became an adult, probably before the age of 15 years old, whereas our brains are not fully formed for at least another 10 years. So this would have limited. Let's have the next slide. Um, uh, you can take these away and look at them. I don't, I don't have to read all this out in detail to you. But in, uh, in short, 
Um, these people were precociously developed and therefore much more limited. They would be behaving perhaps more like, let's say, um, a modern, I don't know, four or five year old child of modern adult height and with a small brain. Well, they were not doing too badly if they kept uh, uh, making uh, things, making stuff uh, with their hands, doing things, and then forgetting about them because their, their main purpose was to survive and they had to eat and find something to eat and they couldn't spend all their time in these rather unproductive activities. So let's say that, um, let's take the um, active influence uh, approach to this and suggest that from the perspective of the free energy principle and active influence, the differences uh, that we're seeing uh, contextualize the experience dependent learning and planning and influence on a small scale, but they reflect the structural neurobiological priors uh, that could be inherited by epigenetic and genetic processes uh, within the hierarchically uh, um, mechanistic minds that were evolving and which certainly were not the same as those of modern chimpanzees and uh, gorillas that don't do all these things that even our homo ancestors were doing one and a half million years ago. Well, okay, I accept that the uh, absence of uh, evidence need not imply uh, the evidence of that absence, but that fails to satisfy most people or many people, particularly scientists like ourselves. Certainly, uh, the Darwin's argument had power, has power. But if we take a look at early human evolution, uh, from the perspective of the free energy principle, our proposal invokes an overarching methodological paradigm grounded in an existential principle fundamental to the evolution of living organisms and is consistent both with the long periods of time and the vast periods of space in the old world that we are dealing with, let's say 60,000 or even 80,000 generations across three continents. And nevertheless, uh, explain allows us to interpret from the point of view of natural selection uh, what was going on, albeit imperceptibly slowly, uh, by natural selection and adaptation. At least some of the irregular regularities and regular irregularities of phenomena attributable to Homo in the Pleistocene record reflect the kinds of plausibly anomalous behavioral outcomes that doubtless occurred often in a snakes and ladders model of evolution in early members of our genus, regardless of what species we want to call their skeletal remains, whether Neanderthals, Homo erectus, modern Homo, whatever. Okay, these are plausible. Uh, outcomes of behavior by individuals who fail to maintain orthodox behavioral responses when faced with cognitive surprisals and who showed almost certainly particular neurobiological propensity to exploring unorthodox possibilities. A propensity that's involved further in humans and in great apes, which unlike, unlike even our very young children, seem unable to envisage how things might be, as well as how they actually are, as the Canadian psychologist and climatologist, Professor Anne Rustin, uh, has written. And with that, I will uh, end my little uh, introduction, which I hope will um, explain a rather complicated approach to producing a novel interpretation of uh, uh, how uh, human behavior was evolving during a very long period of time and across a very large period of space on our planet during the Pleistocene. Thank you. Thank Daniel? you, Michael. Yes, you. that is the end of the presentation. Great. Thank you for the presentation. We will now move into discussion. So I'm going to open up a blank page and then Hector, Carl, and Dean, please feel free to 
join. Dean first. I want to just, first of all, Michael, I don't know. I'm not sure what your stature is in person, but after that presentation, you're a giant in my mind. So, and that's, that's not said out of, out of me needing to compliment you. I think that, thank you for the presentation. I'm curious now uh, because the approach that Daniel and I took was one of trying to parameterize a space between the two papers. I'm curious now what Hector thinks in terms of sort of holding up that other, that other side of this set in particular with the paper on to copy or not to copy and how we might now sort of gain some depth perception around things like zone of bounded surprisal now that we've had sort of the introduction with the presentation that, that uh, Michael just shared. Hector, feel free to give a first comment. Ah, okay, so you want me to comment on to copy or not to copy on this one or how they yeah, correct? The, yeah, the zone of bounded surprise in particular, okay. given that yeah. sort, of, sort of the groundwork that Michael has just established. Okay, perfect. I would like to start by thanking uh, both uh, Michael and Carl for, uh, I mean, this collaboration, because I think I was thinking in the aphorism by Newton, well, attributed to Newton, it's not original from him, of on the shoulder of giants. And, and I think I feel a bit shy here <laughs> among these huge intellects, and, and I feel very privileged too. So I want to thank them both. And Carl, especially because he has been uh, so kind as to revise our two papers. I mean, in one, he's co-authored, but in the other, he revised it and gave us very good uh, indications and, and advice. So I'm very grateful because we all know how busy he is. So he took the time to help us and I'm very grateful. And coming back to the, the papers, the thing is that Michael came up with this original idea of explaining this appearance and disappearance of hand access in terms of the free energy principle. Um, and when we were working on that paper, I thought that the same argument could apply naturally to the case of great apes. And the thing that there was this puzzle in great apes um, studies, when they study this kind of social transmission or culture or cumulative culture, or cumulative technology, and what happens is that there are many reports on chimpanzees being innovative, meaning innovative, like they invent new things, new behaviors or new exploitation of resources by applying new tools. So there are many instances of this, but there is a puzzle here, as there is the other puzzle with appearance and disappearances of technology, that there is no cumulative technology. So this is a puzzle for me, because if you have one creature who is able to be so inventive, how is it possible that it doesn't accumulate complexity in the technology? So the same cognitive machinery, so to speak, should be able to produce more complex artifacts. So there is no kind of accumulation of complexity across generations. And that's a, a big puzzle for me. So I thought maybe the free energy principle was useful here too. So I just made this analogy. So it's Michael who opened up this new avenue, thanks to the work of, of Carl. And I just took advantage to think maybe it is because new things are too surprising for gray waves. So there are creatures that cannot cope with high levels of surprise. And I mean, if I'm talking too fast or too much, just tell me. I think you are following the argument, I assume. Is it okay? So the idea is that if something that I observe is too surprising, I have to deal with this high level of surprise. And also by reading a, a paper by Andy Clark, uh, was the title was Predictive Coding, it was in behavior, uh, behavior and Brain Sciences, if I remember correctly. He talked of one can see very surprising things if he's able to credit the sensory information as opposed to the top-down prediction. And this, again, helped me to make the connection. So maybe the problem is that from the point of view of the observer of an innovation, if something is too surprising, I have to 
consider if I trust the sensory information as opposed to the, the top-down uh, prediction. And this kind of, I need to decide. I mean, I'm talking, and I need to decide like it was some kind of animistic thing, but you, you know what I mean. So there is the wake, waiting up of sensory information and a uh, top-down prediction. So my idea was that perhaps what happens here is that these uh, great apes, when they observe something new and it's surprising, they kind of do not credit it. So it's like they basically do not register that because it's um, kind of it's a mismatch with the prediction and for some reason they are not able to credit this sensor information. And this brings us to the concept of the zones of banded surprisal. So this zones is a, 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 an imaginary concept. It's something we, we use to explain what happens. So it's like, if you have a wide zone of uh, bounded surprisal, it means that things that are not in accordance with your top-down predictions, things that deviate much from these top-down predictions can be can be handled because you are able to bounce surprise out. So you have cognitive mechanisms that help you to bounce surprise out even when you are facing huge mismatches uh, with regard to your expectations, to previous expectations. So that will be the, the main thing here. So we propose that in gray days, there has not been this Changes in the brain that allow them to bounce surprise are where things deviate markedly from when they, what they expect. Or in, indeed, when they deviate slightly from what they expect. So they can accumulate complexity, provided the things uh, they observe that are new are not um, very different from what they expected. And I think I will stop here if I can make more precision but that is the basic idea i don't know if michael is in agreement or he wants to add something because i hope i have my limitation with language too so perhaps he can help me out michael do, do you have something to add or to precise um yeah. not really fundamentally i accept what hector is saying <clears throat> his idea was certainly novel to me when he put it forward that we have to think about the observers, not merely the practitioners, because anthropologists and archaeologists, and indeed uh, many people working in the uh, cognitive <coughs> and psychological sciences, have tended to put the emphasis uh, in terms of skills on the person who performs them and not the person who, uh, or not the observation of those skills, which is so necessary, of course. And I didn't realize this until Hector pointed it out to me, uh, so necessary, of course, uh, for their transmission to take hold at all. <clears throat> and this struck me as being a most important insight, uh, so obvious that one wonders why one never thought of it oneself. In the same way that one wonders why it is that so many paleoanthropologists and archaeologists uh, are more concerned with the stuff than with why the stuff isn't there. Um, these are such obvious problems. They go back to Sherlock Holmes and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, but we tend to be obsessed with what we can see and feel and touch uh, rather than um, uh, with uh, what sort of process might have um, uh, led to explaining both presences and absences at the same time. And this is where uh, I find the whole notion of. Uh, active influence uh, so important to uh, tie in with uh, evolution. Um, it was Professor Friston himself who um, enthused me to go back to the lectures that I used to attend 50 years ago when I was an undergraduate uh, that were given by uh, Nicholas Timbergen of Oxford. Uh, I would steal away from the lectures of anatomy given by Sir Wilfred Le Gros Clark to attend those of Nicholas Timbergen and other people. and. Uh, I've come to realize just how important uh, Lorenz's and Tinbergen's and, um, of course, Van Fish, uh, Von Fish, as um, Daniel knows, uh, were and how uh, worthy they were of getting 50 years ago the Nobel Prize 
for physiology or medicine. Um, 50 years later, we're still trying to get to terms with the significance of their uh, insights, which shows just how, how difficult it is for us to absorb novelty. But nevertheless, um, uh, I'm no giant, I'm a dwarf. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants, uh, not only Lorenz and Tinbergen, Fish, Darwin, of course, and um, going back to Bayes in the 18th century. <laughs> One uh, critic of our um, Sci paper said that we were, <laughs> that we were um, POMO. Uh, in other words, we were uh, uh, POMO, postmodernist. No, no, we go back in a good scientific empirical tradition uh, and theoretical tradition back to the 18th century. <laughs> Nothing postmodern about us at all. Uh, I think all of us would reject any suspicion that we were uh, involved in post-processual and post-modernist uh, arguments, uh, unlike many of our uh, colleagues in what I call the social studies. I uh, like the late Lou Binford, an archaeologist in America, some note. Uh, I prefer social studies to social science, which I think can at times be something of an oxymoron. Um, uh, I suspect that um, others will dispute that with me. Uh, however, um, I'm, no, I'm no giant, I'm a dwarf. Uh, it took me all my time to cope with something we were never taught at school, matrix algebra, which I had to learn when I was doing my research on um, prehistoric skulls. Uh, and from then to cope with Bayes' theorem and the approaches or the uses that uh, can be made of Bayes' mathematical statistics uh, using um, using uh, matrix theory, uh, uh, which I've gradually uh, caught up with, there are, and I can follow it, but I certainly wouldn't be capable, unlike Professor Friston, of, uh, of, yeah, of um, deriving it. Um, but I can certainly understand the significance uh, of something that I think a lot of our colleagues in the humanities and social studies uh, uh, simply are not prepared to uh, confront at all. I think they prefer much more subjective, if you like, postmodernist uh, thinking to rational uh, scientific analysis. Well, thank you. Carl. Lost, lost the screen. Can you see me? I can see you. I can see oh, you. Oh, we, we see you. Carl, uh, to. Um, to... Uh, I tend to be. My eyesight is no longer quite as good as it used to be. Uh, so I sometimes tend to huddle over the computer. It's all good. It's all good. Carl, maybe you could come in and um, share how this collaboration came to be or from your view from the inside or however else you'd like to comment on what we've seen so far. Yes, no, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I, I, I also have to do a lot of huddling because of my failing eyesight. <laughs> um, so yeah, just to reiterate, you know, what, what a joy it was to hear that presentation and, and Hector's follow up. Um, so this is this is, uh, for me, an adventure well outside my comfort zone. So I'm here as a passenger and spectator and, and learning a lot. I, I didn't know half of this stuff. Um, uh, you know, even though I did a lot of uh, biology and um, a little bit of evolutionary um, biology as a young man, but this is this is intriguing and um, foundational insights into the way that we are. Um, so, I'm I'm going to make a few comments. It's going to be more of a stream of consciousness, but I qualify this again. But this is this is completely outside my comfort zone. I'm just talking as a lay person here, or a lay physicist perhaps. Um, and I'll just make a few observations. But I mean, Daniel, I'd be particularly interested in your synthesis because, of course, you have a probably more than any of us the broadest oversight from the evolutionary perspective, right through to the the Bayesian mechanics that um, is entailed by things like active inference. So, um, I, I just to forewarn you, I'm going to call upon you to to, to do the do the synthesis and, and to draw. Um, and join the dots that haven't already been joined, although there's been a lot of dot joining um, um, from what I can see already. Um, so the stream of consciousness um, comes really from um, 
this um, commitment to ideas that are certainly not postmodern. I think I'd, I'd probably have to go back to Plato um, and certainly sort of uh, get stuck around the the era of Helmholtz and the like, uh, in, you know, from from the um, from a physicist's uh, point of view, um, and pursuing that, looking at the looking at the this sort of remarkable uh, snakes and ladders phenomenon from through the eyes of a physicist, um, it certainly makes um, complete sense that if we're looking at a uh, a process that would be described as a non-equilibrium steady state that is slowly evolving. Um, that could be, if you like, a mathematical image of the evolutionary process. The definitive feature of these non-equilibrium steady states that have um, um, the your know, biological aspect is that they entail a revisiting of the trajectory to neighborhoods of certain parts of phase space. So if I read phase space is basically the state of evolution or what what phenotypes are doing or what is encoded genetically in a very, very crude, broad level. There can be no other solution to a particular trajectory that is apt for describing a non-equilibrium steady state than the occasional iatirant recurrence of certain states of being, literally being close um, or revisiting neighborhoods of uh, certain um, regimes of face space um so it, it, the the snakes and ladders um image seems to me a very apt image to actually describe pullback attractors which are another way of articulating these kinds of dynamics or this kind of uh, kind of dynamics uh, in the sense that they have this aspect of recurrence and they have this aspect of self-contained itinerancy um which are the hallmarks of any system really that exists over a substantial period of time. Um, and it, you know, uh, it would be interesting to think, can it be any other way? And I would submit no. You know, if you have um, a, a, a physical process that is unfolding at multiple time scales um, and it is endowed and can be recognized either historically or in the moment by by being in certain characteristic states that literally uh, characterize the system in question so that it can be named, um, you know, sp whether it's a species or whether it's a, your behavior or whether it's an artifact or whether it's a process, um, then it must be the case that it has this, uh, it has this kind of itinerancy where things come and go. So it will be interesting just to, um, if you in a, um, as a pure uh, exercise for pure mathematics is to put things like the Poincare recurrence theorem into a snakes and ladders format um, and vice versa. Because uh, I think there's something fundamentally true. It has to be, that has to be the way that things are. Um, and I, I see that um, in many fields. Um, the, um, and two immediately came to mind. Um, the first was um, current notions of the not the spread of ideas or the spread of tools, but the spread of cancer. You know, the view that cancer, um, there are two views of cancer. There's a sort of 20th century view that you get a, a, a one cell in your body fails to recognize that it uh, should not be growing and just keeps on growing. And you'll get these uh, um, progressive and inevitable growth of the cancer um, set of cells and at some point they will disseminate and seed themselves around the body you get metastases and secondaries and the like and ultimately unless it's cured then it will it will destroy the the phenotype there's another view which is is now becoming more prevalent which is a much more snakes and ladders view uh, and this view is that um we're all the time generating little cancer cells but 99.9% of the, of the time, they don't get a foothold. So that we're in equilibrium, um, or hopefully on the right side of an equilibrium, always being host to little cancer cells. Uh, it's just that it's very rarely do they actually establish themselves to, to the extent that they can um, um, get a foothold and reproduce to actually produce a, uh, you know, a tumor um, or a neoplastic growth. Um, and that that 
struck me it would be nice to put a snakes and ladders sort of picture on uh, the way that that particular biological natural system um, um, is viewed and it's certainly very consistent with current views on cancer the other thing um, the other system um, that seems to um, comply with this notion is not again the spread of ideas or the spread of uh, tools or cultural means um, but the spread of viruses in epidemiology you know it's very interesting that um that there are certain um viruses for example that get a foothold and explode exponentially and we've had a, you know we've just enjoyed or witnessed a um an episode of that with the with the uh, the recent covid19 pandemic but there are other um very very similar episodes that don't get a foothold and they 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 die out very very quickly because they can't spread um and um I, I know this personally because we, we were looking for data when modeling using actually exactly the same maths that underwrites the energy principle and active inference. We were modeling the coronavirus crisis recently, and we hope to get some priors on certain parameters by looking at uh, legacy or historical data. And it's interesting that there is data out there on very similar viral uh, epidemics, but they died out too quickly to generate enough data to make sense of. Um, so things like MERS, for example, um, was certainly recorded, uh, but it went away before it actually produced enough data to get a handle on it. Um, so again, um, you know, th this phenomena of um, sort of things repeating themselves, you know, you know, climbing up the ladder, but then sometimes uh, falling down a snake very, very quickly. So that they, they you have to wait until the next occurrence seems to be a fundamental uh, fundamental um, aspect of um, um, ensemble dynamics wherever you see it, either within the body in terms of neoplasia or um, in terms of epidemiology and the spread. Mm -hmm. And I use the word spread deliberately because of the, you know, that, that, that latter perspective on um, basically to copy or not to copy. So if, if you're copying, then, you, um, then you're in the game of spreading. Um, and if you don't copy, then you don't spread. So I think just coming back to you know um, to, to the question, um, you know, what 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 is it that um, de um, determines whether a particular cognitive surprise or a, a, you know, a novel um, approach to uh, a, you know, a, a way of behaving or indeed a way of being catches on or not, um, and um, you know, that dialectic, I think, is you know, it's absolutely intriguing. I should just say, of course, that all of this um, formulation rests very, very sensitively on a separation of temporal scales. You know, and, and um, um, you know, we have to sort of be uh, in the background. There is always this um, 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 separation of scales that you get with with evolution. Um, and in this particular instance, what we are talking about is really whether um, certain things can survive generationally um, in the spirit, I would imagine, of sort of Evo Devo and cultural niche construction. Um, and then the question then is, okay, at a fast time scale of you know, interactions between phenotypes, um, what's going to make that sufficiently endemic to be um, propagated at a transgenerational uh, time scale. Um, and I think that's a really interesting question. Um, it, you know, again, it's the kind of question which, uh, um, as a neuroscientist and certainly as a clinician, you uh, are often um, confronted with, you know, things, for example, like um, epilepsy. You know, what is it that, um, constrain, that determines whether a particular uh, epileptic surprising um, dynamic discharge in a particular part of the brain um, can be propagated and disseminated throughout the brain to give you a fit, uh, or uh, as opposed to it sort of um, auto vitiating or you know, quenching itself because the neighboring cells are just not interested; they just don't recognize that particular pattern, and it's um, and and it's and it's inhibited. Um, and I guess the answer, I mean, the, well, I think we've already had the answer. Um, both Michael and Hector have articulated it, but. Um, the, I guess the answer lies in the mechanics of the spread of ideas and shared frames of reference and whether it is 
too surprising um, to be incorporated into your conspecifics or your, your, your community, um, or whether it is learnable um, and can be um, incorporated or absorbed into your generative models um, such that it can then be spread to the next person, you know, in, in, in the standard sense of sort of um, uh, niche construction. Um, and uh, Hector mentioned specifically one key determinant of that, which is the, um, or perhaps it was Michael, but it was the, um, the ability to um, change your mind. Um, and uh, you know, the ability to change your mind is absolutely fundamental. And if you just, you know, if you want to frame this in an active inference context, um, just confronted with a cognitive surprisal, as it has been articulated, a set of difficult to explain um, sensations or sensory evidence, then there are two ways in which you can resolve that surprise. The first way is to change your mind and to adjust your internal generative models or your do some Bayesian belief ups updating on the inside to make sense of this thing. And that might in, 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 uh, depend upon some experience dependent learning uh, over a suitable time scale um, so that you're changing your model, your generative model of the world to make it more apt to explain this novel observation or an uh, observation of one of your conspecifics doing this kind of thing. Um, the other thing, the other way is not the uh, the perceptual response, the, the belief updating on the inside to make your predictions more like the sensations. It's to actually act upon the world to um, to make your sensations more like they were predicted. So this is a fun. This is foundational in active inference. There's two complementary ways of minimizing surprise or or prediction error. You either change your mind or you change the thing that you're surprised about. Um, you know, at, at every level, at every temporal scale. So just read in terms of whether I am um, um, I'm able to change my mind about witnessing fire. There are two ways I can say yes, fire is a thing, uh, and you know I can then um, incorporate or imbibe that into my world model and um, become a, the kind of creature that actually engages with fire. Or I can act to put the fire out, and then I don't have to worry about it. Both are perfectly appropriate ways of minimizing surprise. Um, the difference, the, the, what the re, at, a, at a very basic level, um, the um, the thing that determines what I um, whether I uh, perceive or act, or whether I engage in perceptual or active inference um, in the moment to moment, depends exactly on something which was um, again mentioned implicitly earlier on, which is the precision afforded your the sensory evidence relative to your prior beliefs so as a physiologist um if you don't know this is you know it, it was a beautiful there are beautiful illustrations of this so if we, we if you if we just forget about the notion um at the moment of sort of long-term revisions or belief updating of our generative model over multiple experiences to an instance of uh, somebody making a fire um or providing me with a valentine's gift of a hand axe um uh, and just think now to um, the moment-to-moment -moment ways of making, uh, of sampling the world and making sense of the world. Um, it's the case that in order to move, in order to change the world, I have to attenuate the precision afforded my sensory information. Because if I didn't do that, I would not be able to ignore all the evidence that I'm not currently moving. So the most beautiful example of this, I think, is something called saccadic suppression. It's when we move our eyes, and we do so about four times a second, we actually attenuate the precision of the sensory evidence uh, so that we um, are able to actually move our eyes, which basically means you can't see the optic flow induced when you make a, a sharp or saccadic eye movement. And yet, 50 milliseconds after you've made the eye movement, you're suddenly now attending to the visual information that you can see. So you can't you can't actually see anything while your eyes are moving because you've got this sensory attenuation, <laughs> which is basically putting the priors um, you're in charge, uh, suspending attention to the sensorium while you are acting. Um, 
failures of that um, can have quite horrible consequences. So a failure to ignore the evidence that I'm not moving and a failure to attenuate or suspend attention, attenuate the precision of sensory evidence or afforded sensory evidence um, looks think like things like Parkinson's disease. So, you know, it, we think that um, this precision is encoded by certain neurochemical transmitters, particularly dopamine. A deficit of dopamine basically means a, a, an inability to um, uh, attenuate the evidence from your um, stretch receptors, all, all the signals coming from the body, and that you're not currently moving. So if you have the prior belief, I'm going to move, I'm going to sit up, walk, um, drink from this cup, you may have that prior belief, but it's immediately counteracted by and dispelled by very precise evidence that you're not moving. So you can never actually initiate a movement. And what you actually see clinically is basically a, a psychomotor poverty or a, or a bradykinesia. The point I'm making here all reduces to something very, very simple, which is the precision afforded sensory evidence. And if you can't get that right, and notice it has to be estimated at every time scale, either in terms of saccadic suppression or on a, a 10 millisecond time scale, uh, right through to um, uh, one would, might actually argue um, um, uh, an evolutionary time scale. And I make that argument because um, precision is it can also be thought of as a rate constant. So if if I've got some sort of um, sensory evidence and some prior beliefs, um, and I now view my belief updating at any level, whether it's sort of you know uh, my neural activity encoding my beliefs at the moment, or whether it's my um, my neuronal connectivity or um, you know encoding what, what I have learned, or it's neurodevelopment, or indeed at an evolutionary time scale, the precision can be read as a rate constant. So now what we're talking about is a certain quantity that is absolutely crucial for whether I um, um, adopt this um, or incorporate, um, instill this novel experience into my model or not, that depends upon a precision or a rate constant, which means that um, one would, um, if one wanted to ask the question, you know, why do some species have the ability to um, um, to learn, uh, whereas other species don't, then I think the, the answer is quite simply in their ability to, um, to optimize and adjust their learning rate, i.e. the precision afforded the evidence at hand that drives the learning. Um, and I, I I'm wondering whether there are a couple of ways to take that, that, that sort of, um, mathematical take on this, on this really single, really important quantity. Um, and just to make it intuitive, I'm trying to get back to the copy versus not copy. So if I can copy, that means that I am um, I'm impress uh, impressionable. What does that mean? It means that I will accumulate new evidence very, very quickly. What does that mean? That means I have the capacity to assign greater evidence to or, or precision to that sensory evidence and suspend the precision of my prior beliefs. I'm not rigid in my thinking. I can learn because I am impressionable. Um, what would that look like? Well, it would look like you were young. It would look like you have just been born and you are designed to learn because you, you have yet to build neurodevelopmentally your model of the world, um, which means that um, averaged over a lifetime, the, um, the degree to which you are likely to learn and implicitly enable the spread um, of ideas um, and you know, ignite this particular um, uh, episode of um, your of, of, of a new tool or a new a new way of doing things or um, um, being, um, then it would look as if you are younger for longer. So I'm just I was just intrigued. I, I think I think Michael you know, was making an explicit reference to the fact that um, that it may be some there may be a key difference between certain species. Maybe the um, the duration or the timing of the point where you basically switch off your learnability, you switch off your uh, impressionability, and you become an adult, and you bake in then, and then from that point on, you become old and wise and stuck in your ways. And instead of actually trying to 
uh, change your mind when something changes. You don't. You become not conservative in a political sense, but you actually uh, try to keep things status quo, uh, commit to the social norms. Um, but before that, you don't. You explore. You go to discos. You do bungee jumping. You um, you know. Uh, make new friends. Uh, but if it's the case then that the, 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 the spread of ideas depends upon being a child at heart for longer, then, then uh, that observation about at what point do we um, get to that uh, epigenetically determined stage of neurodevelopment becomes absolutely crucial. And just e an even longer, this is the, the final point, um, an even longer time scale. I'm wondering whether the same maths can be borrowed, or the same concepts at least can be borrowed, um, to think about um, this kind of evolvability from the perspective of people like Stuart Kaufman and the like, so selection for selectability. So again, um, if you're now reading these rate constants or precisions um, uh, in an evolutionary setting, what you are what you are talking about is basically the the you know the mutation rates or the selectability, um, and which of course itself can be subject to selective pressure. So you know if you um, if you commit to this style of thinking about belief updating in in a, in a, in a, in a mathematical sense at many different levels or different spatiotemporal scales or at least temporal scales, um, then it may be that the 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 selection for selectability or the, the selectability in and of itself is um exactly the same kind of quantity that is the the you know the learnability and the be, you know being young at heart for, for longer that just is the same kind of um quantity that is uh required right down to the level of uh, um, saccadic suppression and sensory attenuation that determines when we act to keep the world constant, as opposed to no, we actually have to um, attend to this evidence and and update our beliefs. Um, and um, if that's the case, then um, this notion. Uh, well, I just wanted to to close on 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 sort of the importance of um, cultural niche construction um, looked at um, through the lens of these this. Um, rate of um, adaptation, precision, selectability at, at different levels, and how all of these couple to each other in a sort of bootstrapping way, uh, and whether that would be uh, your, a useful view of um, the spread of uh, the spread of ideas, um, sometimes spreading and sometimes not spreading. Um, can I just ask it that did we um, did we or did did you latterly um, sort of leverage um, sort of the well? Actually, no. This is basically setting up Daniel for his his perspective. But uh, I'm just wondering how much um, people in um, Evo Devo and uh, evolutionary psychology. I'm thinking here of people like Cecilia Hayes and uh, cognitive gadgets. How much they they think about these. Um, these issues and whether there's the opportunity or whether they have a snakes and ladders like um, view of things uh, from the point of view of um, evolutionary psychology. And that's it. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Daniel. Your turn. Thank you. Wow. Barely know which side of that hand axe to flake. Um, the multi-scale learning is a great point and perspective. We can just imagine the extreme cases in the total acceptance of sensory evidence world. Then that thing defined by its revisiting potentially infrequently of characteristic states, that thing ceases to be that thing in that whether that's seen in some positive um, light, a neutral entanglement light, or a death-like light, it will cease to be that thing because it will have just simply informationally, if not biomaterially, accepted the generative processes in positions. And then the other extreme case would be no attention, uh, see no evil, hear no evil, and in that case, the 
trajectory from a Bayesian mechanics perspective is massive. It's a, a trajectory with so much inertia that it can't be moved. And that sounds like it would never happen. But in fact, when we heard from Hector and Michael that like upon seeing an innovation, a great ape does not take up that innovation, their prior on how to accomplish a behavioral outcome or even at a higher order, some functional outcome can be seen as massive. The Bayesian physical inertia of their top-down prior dominates these potentially sparse or non-linearly related cues coming up from the bottom. So simply by not paying attention to the bottom-up cues, there is the imposition of this top-down mass. And so that's a Bayesian mechanical way to understand, well, if we had no priors at all, no prior, no problem, but then we dissolve. But if we have um, the Titanic prior, then it's a fragile strategy. And so if the niche were very simple and unchanging, that may be locally an adaptive strategy. And on certain axes of phenotype where there can be regularities, we do see those kinds of strategies. Like a bacterium that has selected to live in a constant temperature geothermal niche may come to entrench in its protein structure and in its gene regulatory networks and so on an embodiment that sharpens and sharpens and sharpens its capacity to compete in that regularity from a temperature perspective and therefore at the detriment of fitness in changing environments. So that's one aspect is seeing learning as this multi-scale synergetic and ongoing renegotiation process of the updating across multiple scales, some spatial temporal scales of which there are no problems with talking about those using the cognitive ontology, like perception, cognition, and action. But then some scales, especially beyond the physical mechanisms that those cognitive ontological terms arose from, it becomes like, well, what does it mean for the population to pay attention to something? Or what does it mean for the niche to pay attention to something? So that was one angle on the rates. And it speaks to the importance of having flexible and interoperable mathematics and statistics and analysis frameworks so we can just qualitatively, even in conversation, start to see that as a starting point instead of needing to argue up to that point of that being important. For example, in pursuit of transdisciplinary synthesis conceptually, epistemically, or so that we could explain, predict, design, control, create pragmatically. How can we take that multi-scale insight as our starting points and then i think that leads to a question in the chat which i will ask now mark fruchtman wrote early in the video was the complaint that there was a lack of evidence as to why certain things occurred in the archaeological evidence record how does active inference not suffer from the same issue and so it's a key question. Thank you, Mark, for asking. And was the motivation for one of my underlying motivations for even reading and investigating with this lens was great. If we can describe everything and we have this very interesting mathematics and so on, how do we go from a technique and a method to moving beyond some limitations of previous analysis techniques with respect especially to the historical record we can go to dean or whomever else has a thought i can i can throw something in but i'm not sure it's it's going to satisfy 
directly the question. Um, maybe somebody else wants to throw something in, but I'll, here, I, I do want to, I want to indirectly answer the question and I'll come and I'll loop into what I think might be satisfying part of it. I think one of the things that, that in particular, that to copy or not to copy paper emphasizes is the observer's perspective. So rather than just looking at that as a, as something written down on the page, taking up or absorbing that position, the observer's perspective. I think what the two papers and, and one of the things that we tried to highlight in, and we're so grateful that Michael and, and Carl and, and Hector were willing to let us look at two things at once, was the idea that the papers um, both raised the specter of, and I put quotes around this, the narrative follows what the implications of start with a story about seeing phenomena X actually are. Now, one of the implications of that is that when you have a story, you can't have gaps in the plot. So people who are, are really story biased and story forward, they want those gaps filled in as quickly as possible. That's how we comprehend. But the interesting thing is, if we are actually actively inferring, as opposed to just seeing it as a subject matter or a topic, we can take a game theory approach. And in games, there will be random gaps. Like Charles Saunders Pierce says, an exhaustive inquiry. Well, if it's exhaustive, we're also going to need recovery and reflection and, and so on. So there will be gaps. And so the snakes and ladders metaphor, to me, is like, Okay, perfect. Now we're starting with a game as opposed to the retelling or the manufacturing of starting with a story. So there's very different mechanisms in, in the two approaches, right? There are, are, there are very different assumptions in the two approaches. And then the question around modeling as, pers as perspective swapping kind of pivots on the stuff that Michael was talking about in terms of how is the change-based model depth capacity either affording or not affording that ability to play with time as opposed to being captured by it? Because in a story, you've, you've written down what the sequence is. It's now been applied. Now, you can interpret that, but in terms of that actual effort of starting with a story, it's now stabilized, per se, relatively speaking. So let's start with a game. And Carl's heard this before because I asked him a question about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, is starting with a game is a prediction matter expertise strategy or a bias. Starting with a story is a subject matter expertise strategy or a bias. And you can understand why if you're, if you're dealing with historical records, to fall into a, a default of, okay, well, we have to start with the story. But I think what Hector and Michael are, are at least asking us to have a conversation around is, well, so what if we do bring this other way of viewing the circumstances, taking that game strategy and putting it on the same shelf as the story strategy. So again, if you if you look at the assumptions around why gaps have to be filled in as opposed to there will be gaps because the game is on. Something as simple as that and being able to hold the two things up at once can sometimes at least tell you a little bit about maybe some of the some of the conditions that you as the observer are inserting on what it is that you're observing or examining. Was it Sherlock who said the game is afoot? Maybe. Right. Yeah, Michael? I'm the best. <laughs> okay. Yes, Carl. Indeed. <laughs> uh, Michael or Hector? 
how is this landing with with what you're thinking right now michael go ahead you always know better then i can pick up from you i'm not quite sure where to begin <clears throat> um perhaps thinking in terms of the evolution of both the brain and the body in the genus Homo, uh, we, and possibly Neanderthals also, maybe from as early as three quarters of a million or even or at least half a million years ago, <clears throat> seem to have undergone an evolution towards a bimodal growth spurt or growth, uh, growth curve uh, caused by the adolescent growth spurt following a period, period of childhood slowing down of growth, which is unique in our genus, uh, to our genus, and <clears throat> uh, seems to be related in adolescence to some changes in terms of the agility uh, to react to complex uh, situations, or not as the case may be. But even before that, in early childhood, <clears throat> I'm now talking about the first um, three or four years of life, uh, our infants seem to have exceeded uh, already quite considerably their cognitive ability, particularly with regard to working memory, when contrasted against the uh, present great apes. In other words, there has definitely been not merely an expansion of <clears throat> the brain, uh, but in particular, uh, changes in um, the co connective systems within the brain, which clearly must have an evolutionary physical basis in terms of uh, structure, both um, uh, inter and in particular intra neuronal structure which when I began to study uh, medicine and physiology uh, over a long time ago now, 1960, um, uh, we could barely imagine. Uh, it was only in the very end of the 1950s, I think 59, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Professor Friston can correct me, that uh, at Cambridge, Henry Huxley was doing, uh, in, uh, began to do intra-neuronal studies on on, on action potentials. Uh, we were doing them in the lab at Oxford as undergraduates about four years later, and um, then I was doing them under Professor Powell Gleese at Göttingen a few years later still, uh, with a practical application, um, because we were studying uh, the, cha the changes in these following orthocresyl phosphate poisoning, um, uh, which had a structural situation in hens, which we were working on, similar to those in humans who had suffered from a massive um, outbreak of poisoning at Agadir in Morocco when a lot of local people were sold American jet fuel oil uh, rich in orthocresyl phosphates for cooking with and there was an epidemic and many deaths um, which is well known in, in medical history. And so some of these uh, early studies uh, even then were having applications which now uh, seem almost Paleolithic uh, when we think of the work which is being done on intraneuronal and also on synaptic connectivity, intraneural uh, neuronal transmission, and the effects not merely <coughs> uh, of genetics, such as, for example, synaptic pruning, but also of epigenetic uh, modifications, which uh, no doubt. Um, uh, we shall learn a lot more about in the uh, coming uh, decades, but which even now seem to be telling us that the increase in um, the kind of connectivity, or um, what's the word I'm really looking for, perhaps connectivity is not the best word, uh, within the brain is far greater uh, than anything which uh, is possible within uh, even uh, growing chimpanzees, let alone uh, the adults. Uh, or other great apes, <laughs> and this must have evolved somehow. 
uh, probably in relation to the appearance, uh, I suspect, of the slowing down of childhood growth, uh, followed by uh, the uniquely human uh, homo uh, adolescent growth spurt, which uh, was, must, was completely absent. Uh, one and a half million years ago in early Homo erectus, uh, according to um, uh, <coughs> Professor Christopher Dean and others, <coughs> and which must surely have been a response, or the evolutionary change must have been a response to not merely, uh, not merely some kind of magical physiological change, but more, more likely uh, to <coughs> Uh, the effects of uh, what one might call behavioural responses and fundamentally uh, it takes us back to active influence and to <coughs> uh, fundamental changes which are naturally slow uh, to evolve. Uh, and this is the part which is not recognised by most of our colleagues who work with uh, living organisms or living primates uh, and for that matter uh, living uh, human communities and individuals. Um, their perspective is not that, uh, I hope they'll forgive me for saying this, which those of us who've been brought up in the natural sciences uh, naturally come to expect. They don't have the kind of cosmic uh, time scale and cosmic spatial scale uh, of things um, and of the, the slowness and the imperceptibility of change which come naturally to those of us brought up from school days in a different tradition. And I think this is very important because I think there is a big divide still between what um, 60 years ago uh, we knew as being uh, named the two cultures I think this divide still exists, um, as that uh, critic of our paper who claimed we were postmodernists uh, clearly represents. Um, the more, uh, shall we say, um, uh, um, intuitive, uh, relativistic uh, view uh, in which there is something which uh, some of them believe to want to call an uh, ethnographical present, which I think is, is, a, is, is a contradiction in terms, otherwise there could, be, could have been no evolution in behaviour, but which wants to compare, uh, uh, instead of contrast, uh, as I would have it, uh, what goes on in a few generations, let us say, in a community, be it a small one or be it a large one today, with what went on over many, many generations, um, uh, as I said, between 2 million and 200,000 years ago, there would have been at least 80,000 generations if each was 25 years long, and even that is pushing it a bit, given that adulthood in Homo erectus was very likely achieved before the age of 15, and reproductive success uh, was probably, or, or the next generation was probably um, only uh, a few years away. This is important because <clears throat> As Professor Christian remarked, talking about cancer, um, our longevity um, has allowed us to, and of course um, uh, better hygiene and medical knowledge, but particularly our longevity has permitted us to <coughs> survive uh, in ways that were un unthinkable, perhaps um, in many parts of the world, uh, barely, um, well, less than 100 years ago. <coughs> Uh, it wasn't merely thanks to antibiotics or even better hygiene, um, uh, in, uh, but uh, to increases in uh, standard of living, uh, going back perhaps, perhaps um, a few hundred years. But let's not get into that. <laughs> what I really want to say is that next week I have to have a small um, uh, basal cell uh, neoplasm removed from the side of my nose, uh, which only at the age of um, 80 or 81 became uh, noticeable, uh, uh, indicating that uh, some of these um, uh, diseases, which we, we now regard as being um, part and parcel of our uh, humanity, or the aortic stenosis, which was 
I was diagnosed with, with my first and only ever um, incident of, of, um, <clears throat> of um, um, cardiac failure about a year ago and has been successfully treated thanks to uh, our, <laughs> our modern catheterization uh, processes that allow prosthetes to be prosthetics of, uh, to, to be placed on heart valves by a long catheter from the groin. This kind of thing would have been unthinkable um, a few years ago. In fact, I can remember as an undergraduate, um, uh, as a medical student, watching the first ever uh, open heart uh, operations done by Alf Gunning, um, which was regarded in 1960, whenever it was, 63, 64, as being um, uh, something that might never might never succeed. And nowadays, these operations on our heart are just regarded as everyday occurrences in cardiovascular units around the world. <coughs> Things are changing, and they're changing at a, uh, uh, an, with an acceleration which we can only barely uh, appreciate. There, uh, even those of us who've now outlived our four score years and ten uh, and are on the verge of, uh, of defunct defunction. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, we have to think in terms of the, and this again is important, of the exponential, uh, if you like, put it rather crudely, scale at which things are happening and which are so influencing many people, many of our colleagues in the uh, humanities and in the social uh, studies and in indeed studies of animal behavior. Um, including climate behavior, of course. And this, I think, is detracting from an appreciation of the long time scale uh, and the um, over which evolutionary processes have uh, necessarily to take place. Uh, I don't believe in Goldschmidt's um, uh, uh, hopeful monsters, magical genes. Some people believe that there's a magical gene that in Homo sapiens, uh, switched on our cognitive ability. I think this is this is wishful thinking. Um, indeed, it's magical thinking in my view. Uh, however, um, I suppose uh, my, my own training would lead me to want to say that. But I'm not. There have been exceptions, and one exception I should like to mention by name is an emeritus professor of archaeology who is eminent uh, in Paleolithic studies of York University now. Professor Jeff Bailey, who over 40 years ago was pointing out the incommensurability of the timescales of recent archaeology and, if you like, ethnography with those of the uh, Paleolithic and the Pleistocene and human evolution. And this was not really well regarded at the time, although it influenced me very greatly. And um, so there have been honourable exceptions. Um, who have certainly um, influenced me, um, we do, as I say, stand on the shoulders of others. We try to um, make one or two uh, small um, comments, advances in both methodology and in theoretical um, influences and deductions. And I think that the... Uh, we are finally coming to possibly begin to see how to bring together, uh, thanks to um, especially uh, Professor Friston's insights and um, methodological um, um, uh, what I'm trying to say, uh, methodological proposals and advances. Uh, we're beginning to see that it might be possible to square the circle, to bring together the uh, evolutionary, um, the very slow uh, evolutionary uh, development of the hierarchical, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, mind, uh, which characterizes our genus, and actual um, processes which can underpin this, undergird it, um, can bring together uh, the 
Darwinian view, which um, most of us espouse in the West, uh, with a few exceptions, which are too well known to be worth mentioning here. Um, um, I'm sure Daniel knows more about them than I do. Um, but um, it, it's meaning to bring together uh, the theory of the evolution of species by natural selection of and within species. And the within part is important. And it's beginning to bring, bring it to, to, uh, together with what we can appreciate about human behavior, which is so uh, different from that of the great apes. And here I just want to make one final point, <laughs> which is that uh, in uh, another paper, which we um, which, of which Hector and I were co-authors along with um, um, Professor um, Wright Reed of UCLA um, in, in um, uh, you know, Science and Biobehavioral Reviews last year, we pointed out that there has been too much, in our view, uh, hopeful or wishful thinking about the human nature of great apes. Certainly, uh, their behavior is very uh, different from that of um, many other orders of mammals and not to mention uh, other phyla, uh, other um, uh, classes within the animal um, kingdom. However, there is a big difference and I think this difference uh, is, is best um, emphasized by going back to the growth curve of humans and of human behavior in relation to our childhood uh, in particular, our infants are capable uh, by about the age of three of putting th of combinator combinatorial uh, thinking in ways that are virtually uh, impossible or outside the scope of the behavior of most um, uh, great apes most of the time and almost certainly uh, in the wild. And this, I think, uh, uh, demands an explanation which is more than simply saying, no, the apes are really more like us, it's just that we don't recognize this. No, I think that there is a difference here, and the time scale uh, uh, has to be taken into consideration, which it often is not. And most important, and this brings me back to my last point and the first one, which is that finally we're beginning to get together, thanks to Professor Christian's, in Christian's insights, to seeing the possibility of tying together um, the biological evolution and, if you like, um, the, the psychological evolution, certainly, uh, I would say, the neurobiological evolution, uh, which has characterized our genus and characterizes it today um, in a, a unique way. And with that, I rest my case. Thank you, Michael. Many, many ways to go. The dinner plate balanced on top of the stick. And I think that's the cognitive moment where the top-down constraints and opportunities of our enabling architectures, which for a long time included primarily what was on board. And then over the last several thousand years, progressively included niche modifications and stigmergic modifications like writing. And so just like in the SPM toolkit for studying brain function, there are brain regions that have statistical connections that aren't necessarily anatomically connected and vice versa. And when we consider information spaces, we have similar connectivity patterns. Some are like information anatomy and some are more like information physiology in narrative or rhetorical spaces that becomes part of our extended cognitive selves and 
leave to others in the best possible way those who want bright lines of what is a self. There are analytic frameworks that respect continuities and discontinuities with an emphasis on the respect, the continuities. We want them to be differentiable and integrated and generalized coordinates of motion and the continuous time active inference models and the path integral formulation. And then the discrete time generative model, which is also a map, not the territory, helps us understand saltatory maneuvers over multiple timescales. And looking back at the literature and the discourse, discussions like, well, is evolution gradual or general uh, and jumping? These have been some of the, the biggest touch points. Are things slowly changing or fast changing? Those are where certain lines were drawn and the methodological developments, Bayesian graphs and so on and so on, have provided a instrumentalist lens that as a matter of fact does integrate these frameworks methodologically. That is a claim that hardly anyone dissents from. And then what happens with respect to our past, present, and future when we realize that we're after the moment of intra and among disciplinary tension, not pushing the, the rock up the hill anymore or trying to bring somebody else along, but gardening in a space that already is how we need it to be. Could I make a comment, uh, Daniel? Yeah. Uh, just occurred to me that when we think of the formant frequencies that affect all of the harmonics and other aspects of our vocalizations, whether speech, chanting, song, or even whistling, perhaps, <clears throat> it is unlikely or improbable that these very many variants which occur in different languages throughout the world with their very, very different characteristics and which almost certainly began, had begun to evolve quite considerably by the time that uh, early writing appears about 5,000 years ago. But it's still unlikely that these can be uh, taken back into the past on a slow evolving time scale such that they can be related directly in a direct um, evolutionary line to the vocalizations, let us say, of great apes from a common ancestor that we have with them six million years ago. If we accept this uh, unlikelihood, then it seems equally unlikely to me that we can talk about cultural transmission or technological transmission in a slow, uh, um, uh, uniform manner, um, <clears throat> invariant manner, over the past, let's say, two million years, on which we have uh, information about different technical skills and technical abilities, uh, or at least, um, shall we say, uh, technical possibilities that were exploited by our, our genus Homo. And therefore, I would argue that it is equally likely that the unawareness of what people, what individuals were actually enacting, the unawareness by bystanders, onlookers, or even the very protagonist 
uh, protagonists of those activities themselves <coughs> uh, was a continuous, in continuous evolution over, let us say, uh, 80 or at least 60,000 generations in a continuous invariant manner. This seems unlikely, and it seems equally unlikely uh, that uh, the same is true of different uh, linguistic, um, uh, um, shall we say, uh, uh, abilities or aptitudes. In other words, as Professor Friston has remarked in more than one paper, <coughs> it does seem that the advantages that were taken uh, were taken not on a, in a continuous manner, but in a discontinuous manner. Uh, when particular communicative, communicative skills had developed in some groups, such as to be able to widen their social scope for active influence and had evolved by natural selection within a shared framework of adaptive prior beliefs, favoring alignment of common expected expectations and joint activities affecting their ecological niche uh, uh, formation or development. And this, it seems to me, is uh, a, a very expedient way of looking at how things happened or are likely to have happened, uh, whether we will ever be able to produce um, uh, a theoretic in terms of um, a formal Bayesian proposal for this, I don't know. Uh, I would like to think so, but I really don't know how I don't have the competence to begin to do this myself. Um, but I think that it is, it will, if, if it is possible, it will certainly be, to put it mildly, a challenge to those who tend to think that there is a rapid jump, uh, or a rapid jump took place, uh, which, or shall we say, a small gap. There's only a small gap that separates us from the great apes of the, um, of the equatorial latitudes of the old world. I think that that took a lot, much longer period of time, and I don't think that one could. I don't think that uh, to compare uh, what modern, even shall we say, in inverted commas, relatively simple or primitive communities uh, do or how they act, is commensurable with uh, the behaviour of modern great apes. Um, frankly, I would uh, I would like to challenge this. And I would hope that it might be possible to produce a model which will permit the uh, a theoretic, which will permit um, uh, the evolutionary process to be uh, at least um, interpreted in an alternative fashion. So I didn't mean to be long winded. My apology. The classical information is inscribed on the holograph. In the classical sedimentary layers is... Daniel, you're mu muted. Sorry. In the, in the holograph, we have the inscription of the classical information. And the, the quantum cognitive moment is the unpacking or the rotation of what is on the holograph into the information space. And that I think was provocatively raised when you asked, what if this was all there ever was? What if there wasn't a second hand ax to find at that field site? That's the interpretive moment. And how we interpret it is everything. So in our final 10 minutes of this continuous 53.1, um, if each of us could provide a kind of closing, just several minutes or any several thoughts on um, anything they'd like to add into this session or any directions that they would like to seed or prompt for next week's 53.2. I have something, Daniel, that we'd like to contribute before we, we close the session. 
Uh, I would like to take advantage that Professor Friston is with us because I have some um, questions for him uh, that have to do with the free energy principle and the to copy and not to copy. If you allow me to just formulate it. And first thing I would like to do is that uh, there were some lapses in my argumentation before. Uh, I want to make clear that chimpanzees um, learn socially. This is something we know for sure. So there is social learning and there is even cultures, as Professor Andrew Witten in, in St. Andrews has proven, has demonstrated. So there are some cultural tradition. What is lacking is uh, accumulation of complexity. What is called by Michael Tomasello ratcheting up. Okay, so from one generation to the next, every generation builds upon what was produced in last generation. So you have a tool implement and you modify it, you make it more complex. So the, our technology is the result of many people accumulating their knowledge. So it's kind of a joint endeavor. This I wanted to make clear. And what the models propose, theoretical and, and um, other kind of models, is that copying with fidelity is key to have this accreation of complexity. So what I wanted to correct is that the puzzle is that high rates of in innovativeness does not relate in a creation of complex technology because there is a lack of copying with fidelity, what is called true imitation. For some and for Russo and, and, and Birne, I think they call it impersonation. So I see someone doing something, I copy the, the means and the result. So chimpanzees are more prompted or likely to, to emulate, which is copying the end result, but by their own devices. So they can do different things to produce the same result. And it, it appears that copying with fidelity is, is key. And I'm, 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 I'm cutting this uh, long explanation. I just wanted to correct this uh, for the sake of, of purity of science. And now my question for Professor Friston, <laughs> if you allow me. Um, there is something interesting that uh, the team of Andrew Witten in, in St. Andrews uh, uh, observed, and that is in our paper, that there was one instance that I know of when there was this kind of accumulation of complexity in chimpanzees. And the thing was possible because these chimpanzees that combine two different techniques to make something more complex, we could be a, a kind of primigenous example of what we call this a creation of ratcheting up of behavior. They did it because they had performed or enacted these behaviors before. And this is, for me, it's very intriguing because thinking of how um, in 2010, there is this paper by Friston and other people where they, they talk of the generative models under the free energy principle, and they talk of an active inference. Like generative models are not a structural representation, it's a thing that you enact, you enter with your whole body, so to speak. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Professor Friston. So I'm thinking that these guys, these chimpanzees that they were able to have this complex uh, tool product, they had enacted the behaviors independently before. So I'm wondering if this enacting the behavior before allowed them to overcome surprise them. Because this would be, we go to the core of this idea of enacting inference. Like if you have performed those things separately with your body, then the surprise is kind of bounded and you can act, produce this more complex product. I mean, I, I don't know if I was clear enough, but this is something that is intriguing to me. Um, Sure, Carl. As your as your last thoughts, feel free to address that or anything else. Um, well, yes, I'm just reflecting on on that. Um, I think very important question. I mean, it is certainly the case that all of the um, the active inference formalism, um, both in neuroscience but also in terms of you know ensemble dynamics and self organization of of, of collections of um, things, um, rests upon um, a generative model of the consequences of my action, um, even to the extent you could argue uh, from a teleological perspective that all our perception is just in service of deciding what's the best thing to do next and, and literally how to move next. Uh, just acknowledging that there are only a very limited number of ways you can actually change the universe. You can either move a striated muscle 
uh, or you can secrete something. There's not much else you can do. Uh, and so, um, you know, it becomes very important in terms of um, your characteristic state of being and to have the right generative models that choose the right ways to move your muscles or to secrete things. Um, and that places embodied action or having um, 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 embodiment and activism at the center of the generative models. And it certainly makes sense to me from the point of view of um, both a statistician and um, a machine learning enthusiast that it would be um, uh, it would be much easier to revise or update a generative model in the sense you were intimating in terms of um, accommodating the next kind of behavior. Um, you know, I'm not sure whether this is composing a sequence of behaviors, but certainly being able to incrementally um, embellish um, uh, or adopt a behavior if you had already a precursor that was inherent in the structure or could be scaffolded within your generative model. So, I mean, the idea here is that everything that goes on on the outside has to be in some structural and dynamic way recapitulated on the inside in order for you to control the outside. And this, and this of course, is, is at the heart of early formulations of things like the free energy principle um, in cybernetics. You know, um, Rochby's good, good regulator theorem would say literally that and subsequent um, formulations in terms of uh, laws of requisite variety that the degrees of freedom on the inside um, have to correspond to the degrees of freedom on the things on the outside that have to be controlled, namely the environment. Um, so I think I think that's absolutely right, that if you had already established through having an internal model of a particular behavior, uh, a particular way of deploying my actuators and making sense of that and, and you know, being able to, in, um, to infer it was me that did that and this is me doing that and this is the kind of thing that I do, then you are in a much um, stronger position to um, learn um, or incorporate or to imitate um, something that you have uh, witnessed de novo. Um, and uh, mathematically, the reason why that becomes easier is that the, um, the cost of belief updating in its most general mathematical sense, so I'm not talking about personal beliefs, I'm just talking about any belief entailed by the structure, the connectivity, uh, the plasticity, or indeed, uh, say, neural activity. Any belief updating comes along with a cost, um, and that cost is um, can be variously articulated in terms of a failure to generalize informationally. Uh, thermodynamically, it has a, you know, a, a cost uh, via Landauer's principle. Um, but um, mathematically, it's interesting that it, the cost is the relative entropy between your prior and posterior beliefs. So this will be like a computational cost, a complexity cost. What that means is to make these steps, be they gradual or be they um, um, big jumps, um, they can only be made um, if they're, to use one of your words, um, if they, um, they are suitably bounded in terms of the complexity cost, which means the degree of belief updating, literally the relative entropy or the KL divergence between the implicit posterior and prior after the update is sufficiently small, which means literally you're changing your mind in a, in a sort of mathematical sense in the most efficient way possible. So if you're already close to um, and have the right kind of generative model to do imitation of a de novo um, behavior in virtue of the fact you've done it before, that means that the, uh, the, the complexity cost of actually committing to that and revising and belief updating your generative model is now becomes within a tenable range. It becomes acceptable. So that you know that would certainly make sense if I was simulating that, um, and um, you know we've been talking about ways of um, all sorts of different questions, the questions in the chat, the you know these questions, um, um, and the plea um, from Michael. You know how would you make this mechanics work in terms of resolving various hypotheses? And um, um, 
um, evincing insights into how all of this works. I think at the end of the day, you're going to have to simulate it. Um, and um, you know, there's this a couple of uh, 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 this has not been done very much in the setting of the free energy principle or active inference, certainly. But there now are uh, uh, um, a number of papers coming out within the past year or few months, and uh, you know, it might be interesting to go to those. And I'm thinking of, uh, for example, um, a paper by Casper Hesp's group. That looked. I think the final write-up is something like "One Small Step for Mankind" or something. But it was originally entitled um, "Ideas Worth Spreading." So it's explicitly using the Bayesian mechanics of belief updating to look at how um, how spreadable, how copyable certain um, certain beliefs were. Um, uh, the, um, framed in the in the current age of the internet and sort of tweets and the like, and the same kind of theme has, has also been taken up by uh, colleagues of Connor Hines and Maxwell Ranstead in terms of um, simulating epistemic communities. Where coming back to Michael's use of the you know, the, you know, the importance of epistemic spread and copying, uh, you know, and imitation be, being basically an epistemic spread. That's now starting to be simulated. So I think we are on the cusp in the world of active inference, at least, on having um, um, a mechanics out there that's actually realized in silico that you can start to intervene on a model things of this kind or that kind. And as speaking to Dean's question earlier on, you know, it strikes me that in, people in climatology must face exactly the same problem. Is this missing data or did this thing actually go away? Uh, and of course, it's a really important, uh, really important question to answer. Then, in principle, you could do it if you've got a model of those legacy data. But you have to have a model, which means you've got to basically have an in silico um, sort of um, digital twin uh, of the way you think it works, and then you can compare two generative models or digital twins on the way it works and see which has the greatest evidence in light of the historical data. Like that ha clearly hasn't been done either in climate change or or or, or, or your field, uh, but in principle, that would be the way to you know, way to do that. I'm sorry, I've gone over time. Sorry, it's totally fine. Borrow my my reflection on that. As we again, anyone else who wants to have any last um, words is in the par at all 2022 textbook. There's attention to two kinds of surprise. Plain surprise, which is an information theoretic quality quantity associated with an observation with respect to its prior. And the second being Bayesian surprise, which is what you just described, the uh, cost of movement, which is the, related to the divergence of movements. And I think in that difference between that was surprising and I surprised me or I have changed are two aspects of the scenario because to just be surprised doesn't require one to change at all one can just say every day wake up check the news i can't believe that they're doing that you can just be surprised again and again and then there's the bayesian surprise with the belief updating and that is really where the semantic advances of the Bayesian mechanics are just beginning to mature. Daniel, can Dean? I throw in something? I, I, I hate the last word, but and I hope it isn't. Um, so the propagations have been dropped in 53.0 and 53.1, and um, Daniel and Dean have avoided being provocateurs so far. Um, what I'm really looking forward to is in 53.2, whether we can declare game on. Because I think if we do, if we have that to look forward to, we can push the narrative to the end of the timetable and we can start to or continue to enhance the conversation that we initiated today. So I just want to say thank you to all of you for all of the, uh, the care and passion that you um, shared with us. And I'm just, I'm just happy as can be. So thank you. Thank you. Any final comments, Hector or Michael? No, just thank you for having us and sharing this time with us. I mean, it has been a great discussion. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been most most profitable session. Excellent. Carl, any last thoughts? Again, this, I've enjoyed it greatly. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a real pleasure to, to actually speak to, uh, to all of you, but in particular, uh, Michael and Hector, um, you're actually using words. <laughs> That's, uh, spoken words. Very embodied. Very inactive. Lovely. Excellent. All right. Till next time. Thank you, everybody. Bye.